Hello everybody, this is History Dude, and today I am going to be giving you a little presentation about military history. We're going to be doing a series on it, and this is the first episode of that series focusing on the very first warriors of recorded history. Um, we're going to be focusing on the time period between 2600 and 700 BCE, and what we will be exploring is the development of warfare, ancient warfare, and how it shaped the lives of those who lived in the Near East and the Levant. So, let's jump straight into it, shall we? Now, here is a brief uh, timeline of the most important things, in my mind, to remember. In 4500 BCE, there was the discovery of copper refining methods, and this led <laughs> this led to a competition between the city-states for access to the copper mines of Anatolia, and they fought. I mean, let me tell you, Uruk, Ur, Kish, they were fighting each other brutally, and um, soldiers mostly fought on foot. They had long spears arranged in phalanxes, but they weren't like phalanxes compared, like you know, what you think with the Greeks. Um, units comprised of densely packed rows of troops. Um, and they didn't have two-wheel chariots yet. They had four-wheeled battle wagons drawn by onagers. And that's pretty cool. <laughs> um, now, in 3000 BCE, bronze weapons start to come into use in Mesopotamia because they started to realize, okay, we can mix copper and tin and make a stronger metal, bronze. And once they did that, then their weapons got better and... They started doing more. <laughs> the first recorded battle of history, not the first battle of history, but the first recorded battle of history took place between the Sumerian city-states of Lagash and Uma in, in around 2500 BC. Um, and just, uh, I should have, I guess I should have put Sargon on here, but yeah, around 2350 BCE, there was a leader named Sargon of Akkad, and he established the first empire in the Near East, where before there were just city-states squabbling with each other and fighting with each other. He joined and he unified all of them into a single empire, and that gave them a crucial advantage over the rest of everyone else. But Moving on, at 1275 BCE, the Hittites and the Egyptians clash at the Battle of Kadesh, which is another one of the first recorded battles in modern history. Or not in modern history, but in ancient history. Um, in 1000 BCE, the Assyrians established a mighty empire armed with iron that they had just began to replace bronze with as the metal of choice. And 300 years later, in 701 BCE, the Assyrians besieged the Judean town of Lachish. But that's a little bit ahead of our lesson. Now, here you can see a picture of the Levantine trade routes. Now, the Levantine trade routes are important because not all the metals were in the same spot. You couldn't just go to a mountain and get copper and tin and go, all right, let's bring bronze. You know, I mean, you could have. Uh, copper mountain, you'd have tons of copper, but you won't have tin nearby for the next 50 hundred miles, you know, and back in those days, walking 50 hundred miles out in the middle of nowhere, that is rough, you know, I mean, merchants back then had it rough, they had to traverse the desert, just going town to town to town, you know, but through this trade network and through these Levantine trade routes, um, they were able to create bronze because the people with copper began trading with the people with tin and the, the people with tin began trading with the people with copper and um, even up here it can shows, shows you the iron, the iron deposits which would come into um, play around 1000 BCE now here is Sargon of Akkad, the guy that I didn't really add in that first timeline for some reason. Um, he ruled between, or he lived between 2334 and 2279. And the reason I'm showing you this picture and these pictures 
is to show you how much of a badass this guy was. Now, you see all these little dots? Those are city-states. Each city-state had its own army and its own king, and he had to take them out one by one by one by one by one. And as he took out more and more, his army got bigger and bigger, and before you know it, he controlled the entire area of the Mesopotamia. He had the Persian Gulf, up to Syria, up to Asia Minor. He had it all. And he was, his, his empire was lost shortly after. I mean, his descendants couldn't keep it going. But this was the very first empire in modern history. I, I, I keep saying modern history, in history in general. This is the first empire ever in history. And that's a pretty important guy. So Sargon of Akkad, very important dude. Now, this is the city-state of Ur. And I'm showing you this picture to show you how insane of a challenge that Sargon had to take every single city-state. Because all those city-states have armies. And they have walls. And... He just took them out one by one. I'm getting ahead of myself. He just took them out one by one. He went to Ur, Rook, Lagash, Uma, Yipur, Kish. He just took them all out, all the way up to the Taurus Mountains. And he is pretty much the Alexander the Great of the ancient world. Um, he's a really cool guy. Now, jumping away from the Assyrians, because at the same exact time the Assyrians were doing their thing, you know, with Sargon of Akkad and all this and that, the Egyptians were building their pyramids. And the Egyptians had an army, too. They weren't, you know, passive. Now, here you can see an Egyptian short sword made of bronze because it's not quite 1000 BC yet. They don't have iron. Uh, here's an Egyptian Kopesh copy from Tutankhamun's tomb. So this is a copy of the Kopesh that was found in his tomb. These are the kind of sickle swords that the Egyptian army fought with. Um, here you can see a depiction of an Egyptian warrior with an Epsilon axe from the 11th dynasty, funerary temple of Mentuhep II. And the important thing to notice in this diagram is this axe that he's holding, because these are the type of axes that the ancient Egyptians fought with. Now over here you can see a group of Egyptian soldiers and as you can see this guy's wearing a light head covering and these guys are barely wearing head coverings at all and they're wearing linen tunics and sandals because obviously they live in the desert they don't need to put on warm layers of clothes and they're good now the foot soldiers were always comprised of the farmers and the peasants and you know those are always the foot soldiers now the nobility the people with money now they could hire uh, they had enough money to buy horses and buy a chariot, and then they can use that to fight in combat. You know, chariots weren't like provided to you. It wasn't like ancient Egypt would give you a chariot. The pharaoh wouldn't just do it out of the kindness of his own heart. You'd have to go out and buy one and use it in battle. And you can see where the wealthy had the advantage here, you know. The wealthy got to buy their own armor, they got to buy their own chariots, you know, and they got to get ready. But if you're a foot soldier, you got a linen tunic, you got uh, sandals, you got a spear, and if you're lucky, you might even have a shield. So, <laughs> so that's pretty much the Egyptian army in a nutshell. Here you can see an Egyptian lion shield from 1325 BCE, although this is more ornamental than practical, but their shields would have been designed in the same you know, general manner. And here we can see an uh, Egyptian depiction of the Battle of Kadesh. Now, the Battle of Kadesh occurred because the Hittites and the Egyptians weren't cool with each other. And the Hittites kept moving their territory, and the Egyptians were like, can you please stop doing that? And the Hittites were like, nah, man, we're good. So Egyptians led an army north. Under, I think the pharaoh's name was Ramses, but I'm not going to try to even speculate because I have no idea. All I know about the Battle of Kadesh is you can see all these chariots. You can see the bodies piled up. You can see how many footmen were involved. 
you can see a little city here, of the city of Kadesh, I believe. Um, you can see the, ch the pharaoh here on his chariot. Pharaoh always has to be the biggest one. <laughs> um, this is how the Battle of Kadesh was. And the Battle of Kadesh is one of the first battles that we know of that we know how it actually turned out. You know, we have quite a bit of detail about the battle itself. It's not just there was a battle here between these guys and that's it. It's okay, there was a battle here and we know what this guy did and what this guy did and what movements they made. So it makes it a little bit more interesting. And here are some Hittite archers that would have been present at the Battle of Kadesh. It's a modern representation, but you know, modern representations are important because the ancient world was not in <laughs> it was not just things made of stone and marble and black and white. It was color, living color. And people lived real lives and you know, just like these people. Here, now the reason I included this picture is this is a picture of a typical Mesopotamian farming village. Uh, here you can see the, the Tigris or the Euphrates. Um, you can see the irrigation systems that they have set up throughout the village. They have animal husbandry. Um, they have tamed the oxes. They are practicing agriculture. So they're sustaining their own crops. Here you've got some pigs. And they've got goats for uh, sheep for wool. And everyone, you can see everyone's wearing uh, tunics and stuff, you know, and that it's a summer climate back there, you know. I mean, it's the Middle East. You don't wear that much clothes. But the reason that I'm showing you this picture isn't to just explain daily life about ancient Mesopotamia. No, the reason I'm showing you this picture is because this is the type of village that the conscripts would have been coming from. If you're in, if you're an Egyptian pharaoh or an Assyrian king and you are gathering troops for a campaign, this is what you do. You send uh, your more advanced troops, your rich troops, you know, your nobility troops, and you send them out to the villages and you have them recruit. And they pick up every single man who's able-bodied and they drag them back to fight in the war. And they just throw a spear in his hand and they give him some training. And yeah, that's pretty much it. You have no idea how much Egyptian foot soldiers walked. I, there's a I might link it. If I, if I can find it, I'll link it in the description. There is a story about an Egyptian soldier and his uh, training and how he got enlisted and all that. And oh man, I, I don't think... Uh, well, maybe a Navy SEAL could do it, but he'd have a fucking hard time doing it, let me tell you. They were hardcore back then. Alright, back to Sumeria. Here we can see an ornamental helmet, um, but it kind of gives you an idea of helmets. I mean, they didn't have helmets like this in battle, but it gives you, you know, typical headdress. This is how most people will look. Uh, here's an Assyrian Sapara, which is their main sword. And it's kind of like the Egyptian curved sword. Um, they're similar, but they're different. Um, here you have an Assyrian bow and arrows. And the Assyrian bow could shoot a very long distance. And an Assyrian archer who knew what he was doing could cause a hell of a lot of damage. And here are some ancient Assyrian arrowheads found at the Siege of Lachish. So you can see they're pretty uh, narrow in uh, shape. They weren't like wide. Like you think of like the symbol of an arrowhead today. You think like big triangle. But no, they didn't do that. They just had thin little pieces of metal death. <laughs> and finally, the reason I'm showing you this picture of an Assyrian archer because he has scaled armor and the Assyrians used scaled armor. We have some remnants of this, um, just bits and pieces. We have like two or three links in cases like we have barely have anything left from those time periods, but we knew, or I should say, we know that they had scaled armor and we know that they wore helmets like this and the colors are pretty much are the artist's rendering, but you can tell by the, um, the helmet and the scaled uh, armor that that's pretty much how an Assyrian soldier would have looked. 
And here are some Assyrian helmets. So you can see that they had a lot of different types of helmets. Some of them curved up like this, some went back, some went up. They always had like a pompadour on the top, unless they had the pointed helmets, because that was pretty much the two helmets they had. They had the crested helmets, and then they had the pointed helmets. And um, here we can see some Assyrian archers. You can see the scaled armor here. You can see the pointed helmets here. And the Assyrian archers would work in teams. You can see the one man holding a wicker shield to uh, protect from enemy arrows, while the archer shoots out from around the shield and takes cover behind it. So one while well, one man advances with the shield, the other can you know take shots at the enemy. And that is how the Assyrian archers fought on the battlefield. And we are going to focus a bit on Tiglath Pileser the Third, an Assyrian king who ruled from four, or 745 to 727 BC. And the reason we are focusing on Tiglath Pileser the Third is because he established the world's first standing army. All the other pharaohs, even or not pharaohs, all the other kings, even Sargon of Akkad, when he was leading his campaigns, they would. Just gather up the farmers, give them weapons, send them to fight, and after the fighting was over, the farmers would return to their crops and go on and live their lives as they ever did before. But Tiglath Pileser III thought, hey, we can do better than that. And so what he did is he made a standing army where they were, soldiers were paid a wage, they were given equipment, standardized equipment, they were given proper training. They were organized into units. Um, they had commanders. And uh, commanders were elected not based on nobility. They didn't elect commanders because my daddy was, you know, this guy. Um, in the Assyrian army, you could be a poor farmer who doesn't know what you're doing. But if your unit got wiped out and you somehow led the survivors to victory and you were recognized for your valor in battle they would promote you and you would be a general they 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 took they they valued skill over uh nepotism and that is pretty cool to think about and it worked as you can see because this dark green here is from before the reign of tiglath pileser the third but after the reign of Tiglath Pileser III, you can see they took all, they went to Persia, Ecbatana, Susa, they took Ur, they took this entire region, they took Judah, they moved up into the Taurus Mountains, they took the Egyptian Kingdom. So, a standardized army. I mean, the Romans were the next ones to bring it up. Oh, no, I mean, I guess not the Romans. I mean, the, the Greeks had, you know, the Spartans had a pretty standardized army, too. But... The idea of a standardized army began with Tiglath Pileser III and the Assyrian Empire. And that is a very important thing to remember if you are a military historian. Now we are going to explore some Assyrian siege tactics. Now here you can already see the um, two teamed archers. One's holding the shield, the other shooting. This one's holding the shield, the other shooting. But I mean, you can see the other things going on in the background. You can see the ladders being scaled against the walls. You can see the bodies of the impaled victims on spikes surrounding the city. I mean, that must have been a brutal, gory sight. <laughs> and the most important thing in this picture is this right here. This siege engine. Because the Assyrian army was the first army to create a siege engine for the purposes of besieging an enemy city and taking it. And here at the Siege of Lachish, you can see uh, another one of these, um, I'm forgetting the word, battering rams, uh, battering rams, no, it's a, it's a siege. Well, you know what I mean. Okay, one of those things. Yeah, and what they would do is 
you see that you can you can see the tower or um, you see these little sticks here with little like flames on them those are torches and uh, the this is basically the Judeans throwing torches on the Assyrian war machines hoping to catch them on fire but this thing is the Assyrians had buckets of water inside the war machines so that whenever they started to catch fire they could put it out so the Judeans under siege here were pretty screwed and and here you can see another example of the two team moving up this one Syrian moves up and shoots with the bow the others got the shield and they moved up in teams like this and here you can see some foot soldiers with some spears and shields with the crested helmets and um, this is a, this is how it happened because at the siege of Lachish what basically happened is in 701 BCE the um, Judas king, uh, the Judean king Hezekiah basically said to Assyria, you know what, I'm not going to pay you tribute, I'm not going to kiss your, I'm not going to kiss your ass, like, um, we're done with you, like, we're revolting. So, the Assyrians said, okay, and they besieged Lachish, and they built a ramp to go up to the city wall, and they put their siege engines on it, and they rammed it up the walls, and the exact sequence of what happened to, you know, the falling of the city is not known, but the city fell to the Assyrians, and the Judeans were cast out and exiled. I do believe that this is the exile that is mentioned in the Bible. No, 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 that was the, no, that was the Babylonians. Nope, this is the Assyrians, the Assyrians and Hezekiah. <laughs> but... Oh yeah, and here, uh, here you can see the water ladle that's being used to put out the uh, torches. Um, lots of details, lots of details in these reliefs. Now here's a modern image of the siege of Lachish, how it must have looked. You can see the Assyrian uh, siege towers covered with canvas. They cover them with canvas to prevent them from, you know, catching fire. Um, here you've got the typical Assyrian siege engine, and you got the archers in it, and you got the archers surrounding it. You got troops, and you got this guy. He must be royal or something. He must be nobility. I mean, you don't wear a robe like that unless you're important. <laughs> but this is how warfare was for the ancient Assyrians, especially in the time of 700s BC. And before I close, I just wanted to. Sh Ignore that. <laughs> Before I close, I just wanted to show you uh, the interior of an Assyrian palace because there's a few things to make note of here. Um, one, you notice all the blue. Blue is a super rare color to get in Mesopotamia. You have to import it from hundreds of miles away. It's very expensive and you know, the fact that they used to just plaster their palaces with blue, you know, that was a status symbol. That was basically them saying, look how rich we are. And not just that, they didn't just put blue everywhere in their palaces. On the frescoes, on the walls, they would put the uh, depictions of their military battles and their military conquests. You know, so like they'll be like, over here, this is the time I conquered, conquered the siege of Lachish. Over here is when I conquered the Elamites. You know, they had it. They they preserved their history, and they painted it on the walls of their palaces. So any foreign emissaries visiting, you know, they would have been pretty scared. You know, you walk in and you see all the uh, images of war and all the people impaled on spikes. And I mean, the Assyrians were crazy people. If you didn't, if you were on the wrong side of the Assyrians, they would, they'd do anything from impaling you to literally flaying you alive. And for those of you who don't know what flaying alive is, it's basically when they peel your skin off your body while you're still alive. Yes, you live through a majority of it, and yes, it is must be horribly painful. <laughs> now, finally, uh, oh, what is with this slide? Oh, this slide is weird. I didn't mean for the text to get cut off like this. Oh well, please for please forgive the 
ignoring or the annoying cutoff text. I have no idea why it did that. Um, I'm going to outline the final points that I think you should take away from this little video that I have given you. Um, 3000 BC, bronze weapons come into use. So 3000 BC, they're using bronze. 1800 BC, you got horse-drawn chariots with two wheels. So new war machines entering the battlefield. 1300 BC, the Egyptian military decides to actually, you know, do something about it and try to organize themselves during the Hyksos invasion. That's the word that's missing over here, Hyksos, because the Hyksos invaded Egypt in around 1300 BCE and they just wrecked the Egyptians. The Egyptians did drive them out eventually, but that was due to their military reform, of course. Um, 1000 BCE, iron begins to replace bronze as the metal of importance. And because iron replaced bronze, it gave certain uh, emp empires advantages, like the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrian Empire without iron probably wouldn't have gotten as big as it did. But since the Assyrian Empire had iron, well, that made room for tiglath Pileser III to build the first standing army, numbering over a hundred thousand men. And this is in the 8th century BC. So 8th century BC, and there's a hundred thousand man organized standing army run by a single Assyrian king. And that level of organization, that far back, that was the beginnings of military history as we know it. So I hope you have enjoyed this video and stay tuned for the next one where I will be exploring uh, ancient Greece from I believe 700 BC to the conquests of Alexander the Great. So I hope you've watched, <laughs> of course you've watched, I hope you've enjoyed watching <laughs> and uh, yeah have an awesome day.